Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is Liberty and Riots, Magna Carta in Medieval Ireland. Last Sunday I appeared on the History Programme on RTE to discuss Magna Carta. Myself and the other guest, Peter Crooks of Trinity College Dublin, laid out the background to what can be regarded as the most famous document from the entire medieval period. It's often stated that this document, forged as England faced a civil war in 1215, is the cornerstone of modern democracy. In this podcast, I've used the notes I prepared for that show to examine what Magna Carta is, what impact it had on Ireland, and whether or not it really is a cornerstone of modern democracy. So the first half of the show sets out the scene with the reign of the tyrannical King John, before we move on to Magna Carta and its impact in Ireland. Before I begin, I want to flag an upcoming tour of Medieval Dublin, which is on this Saturday, March 28th at 1pm. It's a great way to spend an afternoon and get a unique insight into the history of the city. There's more on this later in the show, but if you want to book a place, you need to contact me at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's history at irishhistorypodcast.ie Eight hundred years ago, along the banks of the Thames River, at a place called Runnymede, the most famous of medieval documents, Magna Carta, was signed. Magna Carta, meaning Great Charter, sought to curb the powers of the kings of England by making them subject to the law. Now the background to the Charter was the notorious reign of King John. As a king, he basically did everything possible to make him an unlikable figure. He attacked the church and taxed his nobles to the hilt. To make things worse, he was a poor military commander, losing his ancestral lands in Normandy in 1204. He was also a brute though. In 1203, he killed his own nephew, Arthur of Brittany, by beating him with a rock and then dumping his body in the River Seine. In 1210, he invaded Ireland to hunt down his one-time ally, William de Brioge. This saw him besiege Trim Castle, and while William himself evaded John's capture, his wife and child eventually fell into the king's hands. John starved them both to death in Windsor Castle, with de Brioge's wife, Maudry de saint Fleury supposedly having partially eaten her son's cheek from hunger. In short, John didn't endear himself to his subjects. Tensions surrounding John's rule reached boiling point in 1214 when he attempted to recapture Normandy, which he had lost a decade earlier. This campaign proved utterly disastrous when his allies were crushed by the King of France, Philip Augustus, at the Battle of Bovine. Weakened and bankrupt in the aftermath, John's enemies in England made their move. In early 1215, it seemed the kingdom was sliding into civil war. While John had lost much support, he still maintained a large army of mercenaries and some of his nobles. There was no doubt he would fight on. In May 1215, the barons who led the opposition against him pulled off a master stroke when they seized London. This transformed the situation. It was now clear John could not win a war. However, he wouldn't be easily beaten either, and negotiations followed. By June 19th, an agreement which became known as Magna Carta had been cobbled together. It theoretically at least massively reined in the power of the king. John's tyrannical rule would be brought to an end. Among the 63 clauses, many were peculiar to the world of England in 1215. However, there were some other surprisingly timeless, far-reaching and more lofty declarations. The Church was declared to be free from interference from the Crown in the first clause. More famously, two other clauses have resonated through the ages. Clause 39 read, No free man is to be arrested or imprisoned or diseased or outlawed or exiled or in any other way ruined except by the legal judgment of his peers or by the law of the land while Clause 40 read, No one will deny or delay the right of justice. Alongside what would be deemed as progressive statements, there were some very regressive ideas. Clause 54 basically enshrined women's second-class status in society when it stated, No man shall be arrested or imprisoned because of the appeal of a woman for the death of anyone other than her husband. 
With its far-reaching implications of reining in royal power, there was one major problem with the Charter. Who could or would enforce it? While the document itself stated that 25 barons would guarantee its conditions, they were crucially never named. It appears John released the Charter before this could happen. This now made it a weak, ineffectual document with no mechanism to enforce its terms. John's actions in releasing the Charter before 25 barons could be named was a sign of things to come. Indeed, within six weeks, he had reneged on its terms. He appealed to the Pope, who was quick to state that Magna Carta was illegal. By placing kings under the control of their subjects, even if they were powerful, noble subjects, this was anathema to the order of medieval society. The idea that a king, supposedly anointed by God, could be held to account by his liegemen was a threat to the order of the world, as it was in 1215. Back in England, civil war erupted. The breach between John and his barons could only have been bridged by Magna Carta and that was in ruins. The Kingdom of England was now in danger of breaking up. In the north, nobles paid homage to King Alexander of Scotland, while those in the south of England invited Louis the Lion, the heir to the Kingdom of France, to take the throne. While this might seem strange to us, it's worth bearing in mind Many of these nobles held lands in northern France, spoke a dialect of French and were descendants of families who had invaded England from Normandy in 1066. Indeed, it was only John's death of natural causes in late 1216 that saved the kingdom from disintegration and indeed resurrected what seemed to be the dead Magna Carta. After his death, John's nine-year-old son took the throne as Henry III, However, his reign initially looked pretty weak. Son to a tyrannical father and facing two rebellions, he relied heavily on a man called William Marshall, the Lord of Leinster and Earl of Pembroke, who was his regent. In a clever move to win credibility for the young king, William Marshall reissued Magna Carta, using this as a way to rally those to the cause of the young king. It worked and Henry went on to become the longest reigning king in English history, ruling for 56 years. In the following decades, Magna Carta was reissued on several occasions and Henry and his successors certainly lived in its shadow. It set down a marker in terms of royal rule. It had unquestionably limited the power of future kings and established fundamental principles of the right to trial by jury. Next, we will look at what happened in Ireland which revealed the weakness of Magna Carta. As those of you listening to my ongoing series on the Norman invasion will know, after 1171, large tracts of Ireland were subject to the rule of the kings of England. Many Norman lords held lands in Ireland, while the island was massively impacted by events in England. In those tense years in the lead-up to the signing of Magna Carta in 1215, the Norman lords of Ireland had been loyal to John. Two of his closest supporters were William Marshall, the Lord of Leinster, and Henry of London, the Archbishop of Dublin. Through the crisis, John had taken steps to ensure his supporters in Ireland remained loyal. In early 1215, when civil war seemed inevitable in England, he sent instructions to his representative in Ireland to give red cloth cloaks not only to his loyal Norman subjects, but also to loyal Gaelic Irish kings. He clearly was nervous that they might switch allegiance to the rebellious barons. That year, he also appointed Geoffrey de Morisco, the most powerful noble resident in Ireland as just this year, winning him to his side. This was followed by a series of grants to Irish towns. These measures increased John's grip and influence in Ireland, ensuring the war that gripped England had no impact here. When Magna Carta was reissued in England by William Marshall in the aftermath of King John's death, he also sent it to the King's lands in Ireland, and it arrived in February 1217. Next, we will look at the impact Magna Carta had on life in Ireland. While Magna Carta unquestionably had some progressive clauses, it had a limited impact on the medieval world and in particular in Ireland. This is obvious when we look at the most quoted and arguably most relevant clauses to the modern world, that is clauses 39 and 40. These refer to the right to jury trials and general rights to justice. In England, 
the effect of these were limited and in Ireland even less so. This was because these clauses only pertained to what were called free men. Free men were only a minority of the medieval population. As the name suggests, women were not deemed free men. Then, in terms of adult males, individuals were only regarded as free when they did not have to perform labour services for a lord. Historians disagree on what percentage of the population may have been free, but it was definitely no more than 50% of all adult males. In Ireland, the rights under Magna Carta were extended to a far smaller group than they were in England. Through much of the medieval period, the vast majority of the island's population, those descended from the Gaelic Irish inhabitants prior to the Norman invasion, were completely excluded from Norman law. This meant, for example, they could be murdered by colonists with impunity, and Magna Carta did not apply to them. There were some exceptions. The O'Neill, Omwell Shocknell, O'Connor, O'Brien and McMurrah families were all granted access to Norman law in the early 13th century. Known as the Five Bloods, these families, nevertheless, must have struggled to prove their lineage in a society where few had a written footprint of their lives as we do today. Aside from this, there were other limitations to Magna Carta when it was implemented in Ireland, arising from the way the Normans viewed and treated the Gaelic Irish. When William Marshall sent the Charter to Ireland, he followed it with further instructions. While Magna Carta had granted freedom for the Church in England, Marshall in Ireland stipulated that no Gaelic Irish person was to take up the position of a bishop which clearly contravened the clause guaranteeing freedom for the church. However, Magna Carta was certainly not without influence among the nobility in Ireland. The king's ability to raise arbitrary taxes was seriously curbed. Clause 14 had stated that the king would have common counsel of the realm for the levying of aid. There were three exceptions to this. If it was to pay for his own ransom, or to pay for the knighting of his firstborn son, or to pay for the marriage of his eldest daughter. In 1254, when Henry III sought monies from Ireland for the knighting of his son Edward I, and for his daughter's marriage, he nevertheless discussed the matter with the nobility on the island first, even though Magna Carta didn't stipulate he had to. It was clear the general sentiments in the Charter of reigning in royal power were clearly having a wider impact. It's no coincidence that after this event in 1254 where Henry consulted the nobles, the first parliament in Ireland took place in 1264. Then, over 30 years later, the first binding parliament was held in 1297. Magna Carta also protected children who inherited land after their parents' death. Simon de Feppo, for example, had inherited a large amount of land in Wicklow in the 1280s when his father had died. As a child, he could not take up the land and it was placed under the guardianship of Theobald de Verdun. Theobald, however, completely exploited Simon's inheritance, allowing the lands to go to rack and ruin while he harvested over 30,000 trees from his property. Clause 4 of Magna Carta had stated, The guardian of the land of an heir shall not take any more than reasonable revenues, reasonable customs, reasonable services, and shall be done without destruction. Theobald had clearly defied this and in 1302 Simon de Feppo was able to sue him in the king's court. Today many people regard Magna Carta as a cornerstone of democracy. However, in my opinion, this is to an extent a great exaggeration. Many of the clauses in Magna Carta are utterly irrelevant today and have no bearing on the modern world. Today it is more symbolic, I think, than anything else. Indeed, there are more important events in the medieval world than Magna Carta which shape our democracy today. For example, I think protests amongst groups to defend the rights they received from Magna Carta or rights they had won over centuries which had been flouted by the king or his royal officials had a far greater impact. An example of this can be seen in a series of protests in Ireland's towns in the early 14th century. Purveyance, the means by which officials supplied royal armies, created widespread dissension in Ireland. This system saw officials turn up in market towns and ports and more or less seize what they wanted, paying fixed rates. A process open to corruption, it left many merchants unpaid. Clause 28 of Magna Carta stated that officials could only take supplies in return for cash. However, in Ireland, the reality was very different. Officials frequently left deaths and IOUs in their wake. In 1304, as Dublin's merchants saw their legal standing under Magna Carta violated, 
They defended this with robust protest. When purveyors arrived in Dublin that year, they found the town's market greatly disturbed. What exactly occurred is unclear, but it was a very serious incident. The mayor of Dublin, Geoffrey de Morton, was imprisoned, while the city lost its right of self-governance for a few months. This was followed up by a series of violent riots in Dublin and New Ross in 1304 and Drogheda in 1305, as townspeople saw nobles increasingly damage their property as they led armies to war. It was protests like these that gave teeth to the clauses of Magna Carta and made the powerful weary of violating them. Any discussion of Magna Carta and its role in forging democracy needs to acknowledge the role of protests and riots like these, without which the Charter would have been nothing more than parchment. If you have any thoughts on this show, please contact me at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. If you want to join this Saturday's tour of Medieval Dublin, email me at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Until next time, Slán. Thank you.